Hello, I'm Stephen Fagan, curator of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Our institution's ongoing oral history project explores the history and culture of the 1960s, as well as the life, death, and legacy of President John F. Kennedy. This year, to celebrate Martin Luther King Day and Black History Month, we are pleased to present Voices from the Civil Rights Movement, a special series of recent oral history interviews with 1960s activists. In these intimate, detailed, one-on-one -on -one conversations, an outstanding group of storytellers share powerful memories from several key moments of the movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott, Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, Mississippi Freedom Summer, the Selma to Montgomery March, and the SCOPE Project of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We hope that these remarkable, relevant stories will spark conversation and build bridges of understanding and communication between generations. Please keep in mind that these are full, free-flowing oral history interviews. In addition to moments of technical difficulties, there may be harsh language and graphic descriptions of violence. Viewer discretion is advised. If you or someone you know would like to share memories of the 1960s or articulate how President Kennedy has impacted your life, please contact us at oralhistory at jfk.org. We continue to record conversations year-round as part of this ongoing archival initiative, and we believe that everyone has a story. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy these voices from the Civil Rights Movement. And sir, at the beginning, we always invite our guests to introduce themselves, if they would, uh, with their full name, date and place of birth, and just a, a little background about themselves. All right, I am uh, Dr. David Fankhauser. Uh, I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana on November 22nd, 1941. Um, I have been uh, involved in as social active causes and a variety of men venues. Uh, of course, we're talking about civil rights today, but uh, I was also keenly interested in uh, stopping atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, abolition of nuclear weapons, the environmental impact of uh, weapons manufacture here in Cincinnati, especially, um, and like that. So I have been keenly interested in a, a variety of social uh, causes uh, over my life. I also uh, was uh, for 43 years a professor of biology and chemistry at the University of Cincinnati. Excellent. Uh, let's let's go way back and talk a little bit about your influences. I, I understand your mother was an activist. She was indeed. Um, she was uh, she was born to a rather uh, strict Methodist home in uh, in Indiana, um, and she converted to Quakerism, uh, being unsatisfied with the uh, with the method of Methodism, I guess. And um, she, she, became, she was divorced when I was three and a half and she decided to go to college with, uh, with my brother, two-year-old brother and three and, a half, three and a half year old self. And so she moved to Muncie, Indiana where she uh, rented a two-car garage and remodeled it into a home in which we lived. Uh, while she was in college, she became active in something called the Fellowship of Reconciliation, that's FOR. Uh, this is an organization that promotes uh, peace and social justice and intentional um, blending according to race and religions for social activities. So uh, that started when, even before I entered uh, kindergarten. Excellent. Uh, I, I remember my first uh, memory of being directly involved in a way that I had no intention. We were at a Fellowship of Reconciliation picnic at a local park in Muncie. And uh, there, were, there were swing sets nearby. And um, there were uh, several black children that were on those swings. And I went over and was standing to the side. Now I was probably five at this point. And one of the uh, older black children ordered one of the younger ch black children who was on the swing to get off and give me his swing. And uh, I, I was obviously not involved in that. And the child did not want to do that. So the older child pulled him off and punched him in the stomach 
at which point the younger child started bleeding from his mouth. He vomited blood. And I, to this day, I don't know what happened, but that, as you can imagine, that made a horrific impact on me. And the idea that that child should be expected to give up his swing to me and then suffer that kind of physical damage uh, is, is very potent to me to this day. Uh, my, my mother did go to college at Ball State Teachers College at that time. She met and married uh, Amos Brokaw, who was my stepfather. He was a conscience objector uh, in the post-World War II era, but refused to, he went to um, CPS camp. This is, they did, this is civilian it's alternative service essentially. And, he's, and he found that they were digging ditches one day and then next day they would fill them in and do that over and over again. And he said, this is a waste. So he walked out. Well, that was the equivalent of AWOL. And so he was arrested and imprisoned for that. Uh, when he got out of prison, they sent him another draft notice which he refused to follow. So they arrested him and put him back in prison. When he got out, he was drafted again, refused to go. And for the third time he was arrested and uh, he was sent to federal prison in, in West Virginia, Mill, uh, Mill Point, West Virginia. And in order to be closer to, to the prison camp so my mother could visit her, him, she moved the family to Cincinnati, Ohio. And that's, that was the point at which we moved to Cincinnati. When he finally did get out, uh, as part of the convictions that my uh, stepfather and mother had, they did not want to pay war taxes. So they intentionally lived below the poverty limit so that they would not have to pay any taxes uh, for wars. Now that impacted me in part because when it came time to go to college, we had no resources at all. But, um, my parents were also involved in a group called Peacemakers out of Gano, Ohio. And uh, there was a, a professor of um, philosophy at Central State College, Ralph Temperton, who said, well, that Central State College, which was the only state-sponsored black school in Ohio, uh, that they were looking to to get at least some white students and that they could offer some kind of financial package if I were interested in going. Well, I, I was actually very interested just for the experience, but also they offered me, they offered me a scholarship, a work, a work program and a loan. And those three things made it possible for me to go without the financial support of my family. So that's how I wound up at uh, Central State in uh, Wilberforce, Ohio. I went, I went there as a uh, freshman in uh, 19, the fall of 1959, um, and uh, in the spring of 1961, I had been, oh, I, I was active in civil rights there at Central State, and we went to demonstrations in Zine, Ohio, at the movie theater, which did not allow Blacks to enter uh, on the main floor of the movie theater. They, you could go into the um, balcony, but they wouldn't allow blacks on the main floor. So there were, we had demonstrations at that point. So I, I had been active in, in civil rights up to that point. Well, I have been following the freedom rides uh, and the freedom rides, uh, I, I'm sure that people who are watching are familiar with what they, what they are, but I will, uh, So here, here is a map of the Freedom Rides. They started in Washington, D.C. with, uh, with uh, a mixed uh, group of uh, seven passengers on Greyhound and seven on Trailways. And the intent was to go to New Orleans. Uh, and there was no serious problem until they got to, um, to Alabama. And that's where that, you see that blue circle. Now, there, there was an interesting they met with Martin Luther King in Atlanta and they were remarking with him how trouble-free 
that uh, things had been. And Martin Luther King had heard a rumor that they were saving it up for Alabama. And that when, uh, when Freedom Rides got to Alabama, all hell was gonna break loose. Uh, well, I'm sure others have told you, and I was not on the bus that was burned in Anniston, but the Ku Klux Klan had numerous actions against the Freedom Riders, uh, including the bus burning and beatings in Anniston. That same day, the Trailways bus was uh, met with a mob in Birmingham and they were also beaten. Um, there was uh, a meet, there, there were calls to uh, Bobby Kennedy, who was the attorney general to try to get some protection going on. And he ordered uh, that the Freedom Riders be protected. And he sent a John Siegenthaler, his representative to Montgomery to, to oversee what was happening. Well, on, on May 20th, the bus from, Mont, from Birmingham came into Montgomery. It had a police escort until it got to the outskirts of Montgomery. At which, course, which point the police disappeared. The KKK was waiting for the bus at the Montgomery bus station and um, beat the crap out of Freedom Riders. Um, this included John Thiegenthaler, again, federal agent, uh, stepped up to try to prevent somebody from beating a black woman on the sidewalk. And he stepped up, he said, his mistake was, he said, I'm a federal agent, you must stop that. Well, federal agent was like waving a red flag in front of a bull and they hit him uh, and knocked him unconscious uh, and kicked him into the gutter uh, while he was unconscious. That was also the time that um, that Jim Zwerg was, uh, was beaten and bloodied and, and John Lewis was also beaten and uh, had suffered a head wound in, in that melee. Well, following that, um, there was a large uh, mass meeting uh, that night and the Freedom Riders came to this mass meeting. Martin Luther King was there and outside a large white mob assembled. And so there was, that was a famous meeting in which finally uh, Kennedy had to order National Guard out to protect the Freedom Riders inside that church. Following that, the Congress of Racial Equality, who was the sponsor of the Freedom Rides, said that this is really, this is too dangerous. We're gonna, we're calling it off because somebody is gonna get killed. Well, uh, one of the major heroines of the civil rights movement in Nashville, one of the co-founders of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is Diane Nash. And uh, without Diane Nash, the Freedom Rides would not have continued. But she said, she had long been active. And again, one of the co-founders of SNCC she said, we've got the momentum, we have the world's attention, we must continue. And she said, we'll take over, SNCC will take over, we'll find some new riders. And so they were, CORE called off the rides, SNCC said, no, we're going ahead. So she started calling around to black colleges in the eastern half of the United States looking for recruits to replace those injured uh, freedom riders. Being at Central State College, uh, I got a call or we got a call for volunteers to come down and, and resume the seats on the, on, the, on the bus. So Central State College had uh, student enrollment of 2000 students at that point, uh, eight of whom were white. So uh, we were, were literally, uh, it was 99.6% black. There were two students that immediately agreed to fly down the very next day to Montgomery and we were both white, which is an interesting sociological question about what, what was that all about. But um, here are the, the, the two freedom riders, the white ones, the, on, on uh, your, on, on the left is David Myers 
and on the right is myself, 19 year old uh, student. So we, they offered to fly us down to Montgomery, which we did. We arrived in Montgomery at eight o'clock in the morning and were picked up by a black man in the station wagon who met us at the airplane, but he said, follow me at 20 feet distance, do not walk with me. So we, we walked, followed him out into the parking lot to a station wagon and he told us that we should lie on the floor in the back of the back seat so nobody would see us and then he took us immediately to Ralph Abernathy's house. Uh, an almost amusing side note uh, as we walked in the door and again it's, it's, this is now around eight o'clock in the morning sitting on the couch in his pajamas and smoking a cigarette was uh, Martin Luther King. And that evening, there was a meeting of what I consider the giants of civil rights movement at that point. And here is a, this Ralph Abernathy, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth, and uh, Martin Luther King at a meeting planning the, the Freedom Rides uh, at that point. So the house, this is Ralph Abernathy's house was a was a beehive of planning and trying to figure out what the next course of the Freedom Rides should be. Uh, but we did not have enough uh, volunteers yet to fill a bus. There were, however, 14 Yale Divinity students and William Sloan Coffin, anyone, anyway, he's a very famous uh, chaplain from Yale. They were there and they were gonna get on the bus but they didn't want to have, they wanted to be a pure Yale activity. <laughs> they thought it would, and maybe they're right. So we had, David Myers and I had to hide out in, uh, in Abernathy's house till we got enough additional riders. When the, when the Yale divinity students went from Montgomery to Jackson, it was clear that the South changed their perspective or their reaction because violence was definitely not working for them. So they decided what they would do is instead immediately arrest and throw all freedom riders in jail. And which is what happened. So the, free, the Yale Divinity students were arrested, thrown in jail, and they immediately bailed out. Well, that night we had a meeting in Abernathy's house, and this is a most, one of my more amazing memories, sitting around a large table with Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, uh, et cetera, Jim Foreman, uh, and um, James Farmer, who's the head of CORE. We were sitting around the table trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do? What should we be doing? And um, the decision was that, okay, if they want to arrest us, we're going to fill up the jails. So the new policy became jail, no bail. So that was, <clears throat> that was our policy from, that on, from then on. And it took another four days until enough volunteers had arrived at, at Abernathy's house to fill a bus. So Sunday on May 28th, um, there were seven of us and, uh, that got on the Trailways bus and traveled from uh, Montgomery to uh, Jackson. And uh, here's a, I think probably people know, but it, a visual helps. Mm -hmm. So here's a map of uh, Alabama and Mississippi. It's about a six hour ride um, and we had a police escort front and back. Uh, when we got to the Mississippi state line, the Alabama state police fell back and the Mississippi state police uh, took over and er escorted us all the way to, to Jackson. Mm -hmm. All right, when we arrived in Jackson, we were greeted with a cordon of police, almost like a gauntlet that funneled us straight into the uh, trailway station. And here 
uh, here, here we are marching into the station. Uh, I'm carrying a New York Times and there's David Myers at the rear. And uh, I think that is, yeah, Albert Dunn is, has his back to us. And on the right, uh, you, well, we'll see Captain Ray next. So we're, we're now in the, in the Trailways bus station. We sat down and Captain Ray came up to us and said, y'all have to move on. And uh, of course we said, well, why, why? We're just sitting here, we're not doing anything. He said, no, y'all you, you, have to move on. And he, the third time he said, y'all have to move, he said, y'all under arrest. And so then he proceeded to arrest all of us. Um, and uh, here you can see that this is uh, Larry Hunter is being frisked and arrested. Uh, crazy me, I'm pretending to read a newspaper. I don't think, I, you know, it's sort of like you go to a cocktail party, you have to have something in your hands. Well, I had a New York Times uh, in my, that I was reading. And uh, so he, they, we, we were all arrested and uh, taken straight out to the paddy wagon. What was the uh, charge? Uh, Potential breach of peace, or actually, they actually said breach of peace, but there was no breach of peace. But because we we were ordered to move on, we didn't move on, and they said if we didn't move on, there would have been a riot. So yeah, but, so the whole thing is called breach of peace. And in fact, there is a book by um, Eric Etheridge that you may be familiar with called Breach of Peace. <laughs> Take a moment here. Right. Yeah. Put in a little plug for Eric Etheridge's book. He did a wonderful project. Here's a little a little side note. He got from the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was like the secret police in Mississippi. He got all of the files of the of the the mugshots of the Freedom Riders, and this is inside the the book cover. And so he got this whole collection of mugshots. And every person he could track down in the United States, he went and took current pictures 50 years later of, of us and, and put this in the form of a book called Breach of Peace. So, yeah, we were charged with, with Breach of Peace. So there were seven of us on the trailway station, uh, on the trailways bus, and we were taken uh, to jail and booked. Now, David Myers and I were the first white freedom riders to refuse to, to bail. And uh, they, honestly, I think they thought that we were crazy. Uh, and they immediately put each of us in our own separate solitary confinement. We were held in solitary confinement for the next three days. Uh, now, part of the reason for that probably was there were no other white freedom riders. And they immediately, of course, separated uh, all riders according to uh, race and sex. So the blacks were put in the county jail on the third floor and, and David Myers and I were put in co solitary confinement in the city jail. After three days, more white freedom riders arrived. And so we were transferred to what's called a bullpen. This is sort of a dormitory style uh, cell that has uh, eight bunk beds, a total of 16 beds. And you're sort of living communally in that in that uh, bullpen. Uh, freedom riders continue to arrive. Soon it was filled to capacity, and then it was overfilled. And at one point, we had twenty uh, freedom riders in that bullpen, some sleeping on the floor. At which point, they uh, they moved us from the city jail to. Parchment State Penitentiary. And, uh, oh, here's a, here's, I sent a, a, a letter to my girlfriend mapping out the bullpen. So this is a, this is a map of the bullpen with, uh, let's see, you don't see all of the, well, these are, it's, there's, that's better. Uh, you might, you know, now you can see the, Eight, the eight bunk beds and the picnic table where we ate and so on and so forth. Mm. Well, 
So once we got, once we got uh, Jackson City Jail filled up, they then shipped us north to Parchment State Penitentiary. Uh, and so here's Jackson, there's Parchman up in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. Now, this was news to me. The Mississippi Delta it is actually not a delta at all, but it's the flatland adjacent to the Mississippi. It's in north, uh, northeast Mississippi, and it in the on this it is in uh, kind of that lavender color, flat, very rich agricultural land, hot and humid. And uh, I thought, oh boy, we're going. We're going to Parchman. I I knew the blues. I like the blues, and they're their blues about Parchman Penitentiary itself, and it's infamous for its uh, chain gangs and its work crews. And I thought, well, maybe I'd at least go out and be chopping cotton. That would be better for me than just sitting in a cell. Well, no, uh, because the prison population was probably ninety percent black, and they were not going to put us whites freedom riders out with there so anyway they put us on a prison bus with bars in the window and uh several hours north we arrived at parchment they put us in the maximum security unit on death row right around the corner from our cell block was the gas chamber and <clears throat> one of the wonderful things that's happened when we got to a uh, parchment is that uh, up to that point, we had been racially segregated, but in Parchman, they had the, the blacks and whites in the same cell block. So, one of the oh, here's that. Here is a here's the plan of of uh, the maximum security unit. You can see at the top the um, gas chamber, um, and in on the on the left-hand wing the, the, were the women and the right were the men. Um, and this is a view of, of my cell block. Uh, and you can see in the upper left-hand corner, um, tiny little windows. Now there's a screen, but that's, those are, that's the only light you get from the outside. Um, and uh, there was no, of course, there was no uh, air conditioning, but there, there were the lights were on 24 hours a day, and um, we never got outside of our cells except twice a week to take showers. So you had about about a, a 10 minute break where where you would take a shower, which was actually just beyond where my cell was. So we got to see our fellow Freedom Riders twice a week as they pass by our cell. Um, but we, of course, we learned their, their voices very well. Um, all right, so. Now, what was the justification for putting nonviolent demonstrators in the maximum security unit? Uh, well, take a guess. I mean, you know, you, can, you can't read their minds, but intimidation, you know, and I think they thought they were gonna scare the, the Dickens out of us. Uh, they also, I mean, they put us in max, they didn't want us in the general population because we would infect, again, they were 90% 90, 90 black. And uh, I think they were afraid of, of that we would uh, turn them into uppity prisoners. So, so now we're, we're integrated and I, I feel very fortunate. Here are, here are three famous alumni, fellow alumni of my cell block. And uh, the, the Jim Farmer, who founded CORE, Stokely Carmichael, who founded Black Power, and he's, he's the one that uh, essentially started the phrase Black Power. And of course, John Lewis at the bottom, who became one of the most uh, honorable uh, members of Congress uh, that, that who's only recently uh, passed. So those were all on my cell block. We had wonderful extensive discussions up and down the cell block about everything and anything uh, including the nonviolent civil disobedience so uh, I was talking about how Stokely Carmichael uh, felt that uh, the black man in America would never uh, be free without taking up the gun and he would really was he said I'll, I'll use nonviolence as a technique 
but th this is not going to get the job done. And so, but I was more philosophically uh, committed to nonviolent uh, social uh, j disobedience, um, and that that's really I'm a follower of Gandhi along that uh, line. Well, we so we had this philosophical difference, and Larry Hunter, who was who was arrested on on the bus with me, was Stokely Carmichael's cellmate. In this in this cell block now, of course, in the, the cells themselves were not integrated, so they had two two uh, just two people per cell, uh, in an eight by twelve concrete cage. But Stokely Carmichael, Larry, Larry Hunter, at the fiftieth reunion. Now, by that time, Stokely had passed. Uh, by the way, I ha I should give him credit. He changed his name to Kwame Turi, which I need to give him credit for that, but. Us white guys have trouble with those names, I just admit. Um, so he, so Larry Hunter, his cellmate, confided to me at the 50th reunion that he and Stokely wrote a song about me. I said, you got, I got it. Okay, you got to sing. He said, no, I just, I cannot sing it. I won't sing it. So it's clearly a satirical song. Maybe it's better. I don't know the words that I can let my imagination go. But uh, one of my claims to fame is Stokely Carmichael wrote a song about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, one of the wonderful things that happened as a result of uh, being housed in the same cell block with Black Freedom Riders is that I like to say, not even tongue in cheek, that the Black Freedom Riders taught us white boys how to sing. And we, we, we sang and we sang and we sang. It was just, and uh, to this day, uh, I firmly believe that the, that the songs form a spiritual foundation and core for the Freedom Rides, Ride movement. And of course, all of these, all of these, most of these freedom songs were derived from spirituals and spirituals were in their own way, protest songs. They were in the guise of religious songs, but they also, they're, you know, uh, go down Moses and uh, drinking gourd. And so, I mean, all of these songs really are taking examples out of the Bible uh, for what imprisoned and oppressed people could be doing. Anyways, they're perfectly designed for protest songs. And uh, I, on my webpage, I list, I think, about 50 songs that I just could remember singing. And uh, to this day, if I hear them, I, it just raises the hair on, uh, it gives me goosebumps. It's so wonderful. So... And when I give it, when I give a talk on Freedom Rides, I make a point of teaching one at least one of those songs to the audience because they, I think it's really important to get a feel for how important that was. Well, we were singing, I mean, morning, noon, and night, literally, and uh, the guards, all of them white. There was no such thing as a black guard. All the white, they hated it, of course. And uh, they first said we had to stop because we were bothering the cooks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now think about it. What, what complexion do you think the cooks are? Okay, of course they're black. Well, no, we were not bothering the cooks. We were bothering the white guards. So they said, if you don't stop singing, we're gonna take away your toothbrushes. Now, by the way, the possess what did we have when they put, well, they never gave us clothes. They only gave us uh, boxer shorts and a t-shirt. Uh, they gave us a toothbrush and a Bible and a tin cup. That, that's all we had in this. So if you take away the toothbrush, that's one of your few possessions. I guess they thought we would really fold under that. Well, we kept singing. So then they said, okay, uh, if you don't stop singing, we're gonna take away your Bible took away the Bible. Well, about half of the Freedom Riders were ministers of some form or another, so we didn't really need a Bible for spiritual sustenance. Then they turned off the water so we couldn't flush the toilets. Then they started salting the food heavily, and we still were singing. 
then they took away our mattresses uh, and 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 sheets. So we had no, now the, the beds, the bunk beds in the maximum security unit consists of quarter inch steel with one inch holes drilled periodically for ventilation. So when when you take the mattress away, you're sitting on you're sleeping on quarter inch steel with these holes that leave amazing impressions on your back if you leave sleep for okay so we're still singing so then re remember that picture i showed of the uh the cell block with those narrow windows at the top they took the screens off the windows now remember the lights are on 24 hours a day and the this is in the mississippi delta hot humid and the mosquitoes are incredible uh, mosquitoes and other insects, but the mosquitoes came swarming in and you could see them buzzing around the lights and we were unprotected because now we didn't have sheets or mattresses and so we were exposed to the mosquitoes. And I, I think even at the time they took them off, we, we still sang them a song or two. Well, at two o'clock that morning, the next, in the morning, uh, when the guards changed shifts, the new shift guards looked around and said, well, look at all them bugs. I think we're gonna to have to spray. So around three o'clock in the morning, we hear, it sounds like a big diesel truck pull up outside the window and sounded like a fire truck. And they thread this giant hose through the window. I thought, what is this? They, is that a fire truck? No, it's a DDT spraying truck. And they, they hose down the entire cell block with us unprotected in our cells. Uh, and everything was drenched with eye stinging, poisonous, uh, probably DDT. Well, the next morning, uh, the warden himself shows up. I mean, this is like the president coming and visiting you in your home. The warden, you never, so he shows up, he smokes a pipe and he was standing right outside of my cell. I was in cell five and I saw him trying to fill his pipe and the tobacco was falling on the floor. He was so visibly shaken. He said, now boys, we don't need all this mess. We got off on the wrong foot. If you'll just quiet down your singing, we'll, we'll give you your mattresses back and, uh, and your Bibles and your toothbrushes. And he said, we, we will not stop singing. Uh, he said, well, just tone it down. We, we would not agree even to that. He said, well, we'll see. So he gave us all the stuff back. We're scratching our head. What's going on here? That afternoon, uh, there was suddenly appeared uh, four people dressed, in, dressed to the nines in suits. Uh, one of them was a woman. She was very well dressed. Well, it turns out this is a delegation sent by the governor of Minnesota to see how the Freedom Riders were being treated. Four of the Freedom Riders were from Minnesota. And so that was the reason, that's the excuse that the governor sent this delegation. And I'm sure if they, had, I don't know what would have happened if they had, had not arrived, but things changed somewhat. For, I mean, we got all the stuff back. We continued to sing, but we still got no exercise. We got no letters. I mean, you know, we were incommunicado in prison. So, um, that was somewhere probably around June 20th or so. Uh, we were still as, uh, <clears throat> so we were, I was still uh, imprisoned. When you, if you refuse bail, you have 40 days in which to post bail or else you have to serve the full sentence. And the full sentence was six months for breach of peace. So I was on, on uh, July 8th, that was the 40th day. And uh, I thought, well, I'll, they'll be releasing me today. No. So that July 9th, oh, it's the 41st day, still not released. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be in here till Christmas. On July 10th, the 42nd day, uh, they came to my cell and said, uh, come with me. And uh, they gave me back my street clothes and the, and the guard who had been one of the more vicious guards leaned over to me and said, well, you know, you understand, we, we don't hate you. We just, we're just doing our job. 
And I thought that was the closest thing that he could do to an apology. And it, it felt like almost a confirmation that um, nonviolent civil disobedience can create bridges at the same time that you're protesting uh, injustice. So um, they, they uh, took me back to Jackson um, and they put me on a train for Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, I remember as the train passed from Mississippi into Tennessee. Now that doesn't sound like a big improvement, but it felt, it felt like a big improvement. I mean, I could take a deep breath getting out of Mississippi and into Tennessee. When the train arrived in Cincinnati, and I have to show you, I don't know if, how much you know about Cincinnati, uh, but there is a magnificent uh, terminal, Union Terminal, Art Deco Terminal, and you can see all the all the the trains come in and see all those uh, tracks at the top, and then. Here's a magnificent uh, 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 concourse with fa fabulous uh, murals, by the way. Well, on the train, as it pulled into the station and stopped, I could hear singing. I said, what is that singing? The Cincinnati local corps had shown up with 50 members to, to welcome me out of jail and back to freedom. And they were there singing freedom songs and two big guys got me up on their shoulders and carried me the length of the concourse. Talk about culture shock uh, to celebrate my release from the, from the freedom rides. So, so that, that was the, that's the, my experience in jail. I will say that uh, I, I would, people would say, well, what do you think you accomplished? And uh, here, here again, there is there are the uh, freedom riders that the mugshots uh, were published, um, and uh, I'm, that blue arrow shows me at the top there. And uh, the things that were accomplished: first of all, Bobby Kennedy finally on uh, on November first of 1961 ordered them to remove all signs of discrimination. So all these signs, whites only, blacks only came down. And so we did effectively integrate the interstate transportation facilities. Uh, that really is not as important as uh, what I think happened with the Freedom Rise. And that is the civil rights movement up to that point had always been local. Uh, it had been the local Kreskis or the local uh, swimming pool or the local um, lunch counter, or the, but uh, this had turned, or the local bus boycott in Montgomery, but these were not national movements. Because the Freedom Rides drew Freedom Riders from all over the nation, it, the whole nation became involved in that, in that demonstration and turned the Civil Rights Movement into a national movement. Okay, so yeah, no, well, but we, did, we, we did not solve prejudice and social racial injustice. <laughs> we, we chipped away at it. Yeah. I was just curious, when you were incarcerated, were you getting local news coverage there in Cincinnati about what was happening to you? Uh, well, uh, I, was, I wasn't getting any news coverage at all. We were incommunicado. But uh, my understanding was that the Cincinnati papers did cover it. Uh, somebody said that there was a, a picture of our of my arrest on the front page of the New York Times. I've never seen it. But the, the, after the buses were burned, the whole, I mean, literally, the whole world was watching. Uh, you know, whether Moscow or China or Europe or everywhere was riveted with, uh, with that kind of um, violent resistance to just black and white folks sitting together. How did your mom feel about your, uh, your involvement in that? Well, you know, that's, that is an excellent question. And uh, I already told you a little bit about her convictions. 
And I am reminded now, I was a 19 year old, which I think freedom rides are tailored for 19 year olds because the, they have no sense of uh, proportion. I mean, you know, they, they act on their ideals. They feel like they're never going to die. Their ability to weigh uh, risk, I mean, you know, it's the same old, well, who do you send to war to fight your war? So the 19 year olds are the, are the favorite people. Well, I believe that my mother reacted in much the same way that a mother who was convic convinced that a war was just and her 19 year old boy signs up to go to war. She's proud, but she's terrified. And I, that is pretty much how my mother, I think, felt. Uh, I will tell you, she knew I was going down. Uh, the night before I, we flew to, uh, to Montgomery, I hitchhiked from Zeni, Ohio, down to Cincinnati. She gave me a haircut so I'd look real nice. I got, on, got my best suit, so you got to look good when you're going to get arrested. But I think, you know, she was, uh, she was uh, approved of it but not without fundamental fear. You know, there's a big difference. The, the, it's easy for a white man from the North to join the Freedom Rides. I mean, not easy, but it is, that's one thing. But when it's over, you go back home and you're, you know, you're relatively anonymous. The black youth in the South, when they get, they go back home they go back into enemy territory and it's it's much more of a commitment for them to to take on this kind of project when they they can never escape out of uh, you know that small town alabama mississippi and some of those some of those black freedom riders confided in me that uh they joined without telling their parents because they their parents would not have allowed them to do it anyway yeah well, but let me go back if I could, uh, because of course we're here at the site of the Kennedy assassination and so right. interested in the 60s within the context of the Kennedy presidency. Right. If we could go back just a little bit to that 1960 election, I'm curious as a young man, this transition from Eisenhower, the oldest president in history to Kennedy, yeah. what did that mean to you and how did you feel about this, this young president? Well, I, I, again, my grasp of politics were relatively naive, okay? But I thought that uh, it was, it was gonna signal a major change. Um, but um, I wish I thought it had made a greater change than in fact it did. But I, have, I do have a little graphic here to talk about. Well, of course, can't, I mean, okay, Camelot. They were the, it was, he was the most handsome president ever. And his wife was the most beautiful first lady ever. And people were in love. I mean, why do we judge people according to their looks? But if you do, he, he was at the top of the list and was so well-spoken and so um, um, where, where is that? I'm looking, for, uh, I might not have, okay. I don't, I don't have that graphic. So, I do, I honestly do not think he was all, I mean, I think he thought segregation was wrong, but the last thing he wanted to do was get the Democratic Party involved in, uh, in integrating uh, the nation. Uh, a major reason, of course, is that the power of the Democratic Party was seated in the South because over and over again, senators from the South would be reelected and representatives reelected. So what that does is give you seniority. When you have seniority, you are the chair of the committees. So the Dixiecrats were extremely powerful. Um, and um, so he did not want to ruffle their feathers. Uh, it ultimately came, to push came to shove and uh, they had to in fact enforce uh, the Supreme Court law that said it was unconstitutional. But uh, I will tell you by the same token, uh, I've never been more uh, apprehensive about my personal survival than with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I thought we, I don't, 
most people agree we've never come closer to nuclear war than we did in those few days in October of, uh, you know, the year better than I was at 62. 62. Oh, so that was even after. Okay. Um, but, um, and I don't know, he, he, there were, I had problems with the Cuban Missile, uh, with the uh, Bay of Pigs. I mean, uh, he was not a perfect president, but um, he seemed to have a good heart. Uh, but there's never been a president I agreed with 100% anyway, so what are we going to do? <laughs> Where were you on the day of the assassination? I, that's interesting. I, I, anybody my age knows exactly where they were. I had graduated from college the previous June, and I was hitchhiking around Europe with a backpack and a sleeping bag for six months. And uh, I, went, I, I went to 26 different countries. I happened to be in Vienna, Austria on November 22nd, 1963. And um, I was at the opera. Um, I had gotten student tickets for, for $5 for standing room to listen to Die Valkyrie, Wagner's Die Valkyrie. Well, I was not a keen opera fan. And after about an hour and a half, I said, really, I'm not really enjoying standing here to this. So. I, so I left and, and outside the Staatsoper in Vienna, a catty corner across the street, there was a newsstand with a crowd of people around it. I said, what's that about? So I crossed over there and people were openly weeping in front of this newsstand. And I looked and the, the headline was Kennedy tot, which in German means Kennedy's dead. It still hits us. I mean, and I, <clears throat> that night uh, there were other. I was a student at Earlham College at that point. I had graduated from Earlham, but there were there was a group of Earlham students at uh, who were doing a foreign study in Vienna, and they had scheduled a party that night. So I went to the party anyway, but it was hardly a party. Just everybody was just weeping and and clutching to each other. It was just. Incredible. So yeah, I know exactly where I was. And you know, those of us in education uh, know that there's two ways to generate very strong memories. One is repetition, you call study, and the other is emotional impact. And that's why we can remember exactly where we were uh, when Kennedy was shot, when the towers were hit by, by, by airliners. I mean, these major events just burn themselves into our memory. Uh, happening as it did in a segregated city like Dallas, and considering your own experiences a couple of yeah. years earlier, did did you initially assume that it was a segregationist that had killed the president? Did you think civil rights was involved? Uh, well, uh, I was I was certain that it was a political assassination, uh, and I thought uh, it did occur to me it could have been it could have been segregation related because they were, Southerners were furious. And of course the whole of South hated, viciously hated Kennedy. Uh, and, but they hated him not just for the segregation issue, but that was a major one. But yes, I, I, that had, I thought that had to be a major factor. Um, and uh, I think it probably to this day, um, I, I'm not necessarily, a, conspiracy theorists, but I, 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 I don't think, I think we'll never fully know what the explanation of that, but it was not, I do not believe it was one, you know, misfit. Uh, it's just too many, too many impossibilities that, uh, for that to be the explanation, but it was convenient because he spent some time in Cuba and blah, 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 you know. Yeah, I, I, I also think, by the way, the evidence is that Kennedy was beginning to have second thoughts about the uh, about the about nuclear weapons and about the uh, military, and uh, I I think it, it was uh, not exactly a coup, but I think that there are powerful forces that that benefited by him being removed from office. So that old thing of follow the money. Well, who benefited from his assassination? And there there are people that did. 
uh, benefit from this assassination. How do you feel about Johnson kind of harnessing Kennedy's memory and, and using it to push that civil rights legislation through in 64? Okay, well, Johnson is the supreme politician in, in, in a way that Kennedy was not. Uh, Kennedy was, you know, he, his good looks and his demeanor were good, but Johnson knew the levers of power and how to twist arms and he would break your arm twisting it. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm grateful of all things. I mean, John, talk about a mixed bag. Johnson really did move us forward on civil rights. Uh, by the way, I don't have the graphic in front of me, but there is the fear of Kennedy, of switching, of destroying the Democratic Party uh, came true because all of those extreme right-wing segregationists, as soon as the civil rights bill was passed, they jumped ship immediately and became the most conservative wing of the Republican Party. I mean, they did talk about turncoats. Uh, and uh, it's very striking to see how the solid South, which had voted nothing but Democrat for decades, suddenly voted either very strongly Republican or even worse for Wallace, who was a segregationist on the, you know, the state's rights party or whatever it was called. So. It is true that, that it did fracture the Democratic Party and weakened it substantially for them to take this stand for social justice. But uh, I do give Johnson credit for that. Uh, to this day, I'm still surprised. I mean, I don't know. He was not committed to, he was not a integrationist, uh, not really committed to social justice, but for some reason he took it on and he did. Uh, and I'm grateful. Then, then he went deep six for the Vietnam War, for God's sake. Right. Yeah. Which, by the way, which, by the way, Kennedy uh, gets substantial credit for getting us into Vietnam in the first place, as you know. <laughs> I, I imagine you were a peace movement activist. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, the Viet, yeah. Uh, I was, uh, I was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins in the, in the mid 60s, uh, when the all of these major Vietnam demonstrations took place. And uh, being in Baltimore, we went down for all of those major demonstrations uh, against the Vietnam War. During by the way, by the way, I missed I missed the 63 uh, civil rights demonstration in Washington because I was hitchhiking around in Europe. I think I was in I think I was in Edinburgh at the time and I was I felt like I wanted to be there, but I wasn't. Yeah. yeah, the uh, the March on Washington you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. During those freedom summers in 64, 65, when all the voter registration was taking place, the Mississippi and elsewhere, did you ever consider going back to Mississippi? And uh, I, would, I was not eager to go back to Mississippi. Um, uh, in fact, I never went back to Mississippi for another almost well, 25, 30 years when I finally took my family on a tour of the South. And I will tell you, when we, when we drove into Alabama, my, my heart was in my throat. And in fact, in rural Alabama, we got pulled over by the police. And I don't know, I'm not sure what I did. It was minor. I don't, think, I don't even think I was speeding. But when the policeman came out to the car, it was a black policeman. So I had a certain sense of relief uh, the other interesting thing about that, and again, this, this is the first time I'd been in the South for those many years. And I had uh, three young children, probably 10, six, and four, something like that. So we go to Jackson, and I go to Jackson City Jail. And I go to the book encounter, and I ask them if they could pull out my files because I wanted to show my children, my mugshot. And I think I'm the only person in the world that ever asked, took their children to the jail to show them the mugshot. And the white guy was just shaking his head like that, but there were two black clerks behind him who had grins from ear to ear because uh, of that kind of little incident. 
I know you've uh, spoken to groups and given presentations about your, your involvement as a freedom writer. Give me a sense of how young people especially react to your story. Um, well, they're amazed, but they, uh, there's a sense of disbelief. I mean, they can't believe. I mean, they, there's the visual evidence in front of their eyes, but two different drinking fountains, a shabby one for colored and a, a cool a, a refrigerator one for the other. Uh, I mean, they, they, they just can't believe that it was ever that way. Um, and, but I also get, I, I, I was a professor for, for 43 years and I do have uh, a sense of faith in these, in the young people that they are, uh, I love their, they still have a sense of idealism uh, and there I see them picking up, especially the climate change, they're, they're not gonna put up with that, they're gonna, and I was never happier to see the both the complexion and the age diversity in Black Lives Matters uh, demonstrations uh, last summer. It was just wonderful. Um, I, I would never have guessed that. But finally, it, the racial injustice in this country sort of came to a head for, for a lot of people. And, um, and I do see young people taking the leadership uh, in that. And no more, literally, no more BS. That, that's what they're saying. We're tired of that. Um, but it, one of the interesting things is now, it's, it's not so much now, but certainly five, six years ago when I would give talks, my, my talks are usually to white audiences. And I would ask, uh, ask them, do you know what the talk is? And people, whites did not know what, I think they do now, they've getting it. And when it gives a whole different perspective when you realize that you have to be afraid every time your child goes out uh, if there's a wrong color because they, they have to walk that tightrope and respect the man and so on and so forth. And uh, I think they I mean, then that's still, that hasn't changed. Uh, they still have, a, uh, have to be very careful when they're uh, confronting uh, police officers. Uh, maybe here, as we as we wrap up, you could speak for a moment directly to young people involved in activism today or activism in the future, and offer any um, words of wisdom or lessons from the '60s that maybe they can take to heart. Well, one of the, one of the things is that, again, one of the wonderful things about young people is that they don't have the full understanding of the risks and they are more likely to follow their ideals. And that is the time that they should be following their ideals. Um, that, and do take risks and, and do what you know is right. And you do have a sense, you often have it. I mean, I practically did not give a second thought when I was asked if I would join the Freedom Rides. I, I made that decision almost on the spot. And I was, the next, uh, the next day I was in Montgomery and I, I, that kind of, um, I think, follow your heart. You know what's right, uh, and be and have faith that that what you do will help move the world in a better direction. Um, and uh, every and you know, bit by bit, we don't. It's not one one person's not going to change it, but it is. But you do especially working together and, and from a position of uh, idealism. And I, I'm also, you won't be surprised to know, I'm deeply committed to nonviolent social change. I don't think anything comes out of violent change. And I think wars are the huge mistake. Really, humanity should recognize at this point that war is an outmoded me uh, reaction for social change. Are we, if nothing else, Afghanistan, we're right back where we were except trillions of dollars and many thousands of lives lost. And it's just every bit as bad. I have to say the recent uh, unrest in Haiti, people are saying, because 
the leadership there wants the United States to send troops down to help police. And I'm happy to say that America says, now, wait a minute, that didn't work out too well last time. And I hear a lot of people saying the solution has got to be political. It can't be uh, at, the, at the point of a gun. And so we need to learn to relate to each other in ways that enhance communication and, and reassure that don't make enemies of each other. I mean, you have to, you have to work to establish bridges not put up walls. And that sounds like a pretty good slogan to me these days. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want to thank you again so much for uh, All right. sure. time to well, share your story. Uh, if you find yourself in Dallas at some point, it would be a great pleasure to um, have you visit the museum. And I would be I would look here forward to doing a little, yeah, yeah, a yeah, little yeah. video follow up to this if you're if you're available. Um, I'll send you a copy of this recording so you'll okay. have, have thank a copy you. to access. And uh, again, I thank you very much. Well, thank you for your time and interest and uh, thanks to the museum for sponsoring this uh, collection of, uh, of personal histories while we're still here. Well, <laughs> yeah, this was a long time ago, but there are important stories to be, to be gathered and, and to yes, learn there, from. Yes, there are. Okay, well, right. thank you very much.